as soon as Millie gets us up and going. Okie doke. All righty. Can we see this? Yeah, we can see that. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm delighted today that a good friend, Dr. Rinaldi, uh, found the time to join us. Um, he's a, got a very busy practice. Dr. Rinaldi is from Charlotte, North Carolina, as you can see. He's the director of the Structural Heart Program there and a clinical professor of medicine. But I know Mike from hearing the many lectures and talks he's given over the years and really come to respect you, Mike, because I always learn something from your talks and from the wealth of experience you have. So I'm delighted you can share that experience with our faculty and our fellows today. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. And um, what I think what, what, what we learn is that I, I just like talking. So, so you, get to, you get to listen to me talk for the next 45 minutes. One of the, the areas um, in my career that I've, I've sort of taken a, a particular interest is in transcatheter mitral therapies. And I I sort of got involved in that um, randomly because there was no such thing as structural heart when I when I was training as a fellow. I, my my interests were in coronary and peripheral vascular work, and I got involved in the mitral space through the Everest One trial back in 2005. And uh, and it and it's been just sort of a joy and and uh, fascination of mine to watch uh, transcatheter uh, valve therapies progress through clinical trials to commercially available products, to integration into what most major medical centers do every day and, and insert it into the guidelines. So I'm gonna take the next 45 minutes to, to talk about uh, the, uh, you know, where we are now with transcatheter mitral therapies and what the next uh, you know, five to 10 years may look like. So this is, um, this is my talk. I'm not gonna do an ex a comprehensive talk of all of mitral therapies, that's for a, that's a much more comprehensive talk. We're just going to focus on transcatheter therapies and how they fit into the real world. These are my disclosures, um, uh, particularly uh, consulting and honorary fees and teaching courses. So the, um, the, the most studied and most ex widely used uh, transcatheter mitral therapy system is the, is the mitral clip system for uh, uh, also known as M tier as a, a particular technique. And uh, we're now onto our fourth generation device. That, gener that device um, has a matrix of different devices for implant. The, the first device was a small uh, armed uh, um, narrow device, and that has evolved into a matrix, including long arm devices and wider devices that can give larger bites of tissue. And you can apply these different uh, lengths and widths of arms and, and body um, to different mitral anatomies. And, um, and I think the best way to think about contemporary outcomes with this technology to understand sort of how it's going to apply to your patient population and where it fits in the matrix of therapies for patients is the, uh, is the G4 registry. So G4 registry is not a randomized trial. It's a registry. Uh, it was sort of a real world study that did not exclude a lot of patients. And it included over a thousand patients with, with outcomes that we're going to show here. It was a mix of primary and secondary MR. And a, a couple take homes from this. Um, first is um, uh, mitral, you know, mitral clip or M tier has been always thought of as a complex procedure that takes hours. And that, that was once true, but is no longer so. Um, in this registry, and again, these were, these were good operators or experienced operators, but in, in an experienced center, device times are down around a little more than 30 minutes and total procedure time is a bit more than an hour. So this is, you know, something that goes from a science experiment to something that can be applied in clinical practice in most, most centers. Um, additionally, this wide clip matrix concept um, is, um, you know, could be associated with higher risk of causing mitral stenosis, but it turns out it wasn't, and that it doesn't matter whether you apply uh, narrow clips or wide clips or long arm clips, that, that gradients are all fairly similar in the, in the um, two and a half to three and a half range, sort of acceptable for clinical practice if in well-selected cases. And I think the main benefit of transcatheter mitral therapies compared to everything else is the safety profile. Um, once again, it's been shown to be exquisitely safe um, with about a 1% risk of major adverse events and about a 1% risk of single leaflet detachment 
which usually doesn't involve uh, bad patient outcomes, but just in, in, in no improvement in, out, in outcomes. So overall, patients do really well um, in the acute procedural setting. And then how do they do, you know, the, the goal is not just to say procedure, it's an effective procedure. And with modern techniques, good patient selection and current tools, um, you can, you know, according to this registry, um, achieve one plus or less MR in up to 90% of patients and two plus MR in 95% plus of patients compared to, you know, severe MR at baseline. So pretty effective. Um, probably surgery is going to do even better in the hands of an experienced surgeon, but, but pretty, pretty approaching surgical results. And this results in, in meaningful outcomes for patients. Patients care not that their MR is reduced, that they feel better. So reduction in heart failure class, improvement in KCCQ uh, markers of quality of life. But um, I think anyone who does this work in this field understands that 90% one plus MR is not necessarily what we see every day in clinical practice. And I think that, uh, that it, it's, it, it's um, disingenuous to suggest that every patient that you apply M tier two is going to end up with, with a one plus MR uh, at rates of 90% plus. So um, why is that? And why do we see something different in the real world than, than in, reg in real world registries? And that is because not all patients have equally appropriate anatomy for edge to edge repair. And this gets into the concept of sort of the, red, uh, the uh, green, yellow, red of procedural complexity with green being sort of fairly straightforward slam dunk edge to edge repair, yellow being, this is gonna be a complex case. I don't know what kind of results I'm gonna get, but probably it's gonna be okay. And red meaning um, this is not gonna go well. You're not gonna predictably get a good result. Maybe you should avoid the case. So what kind of evidence do we have that this sort of conceptual idea that there is a spectrum of uh, anatomic complexity that will give you a spectrum of, of outcomes with edge to edge repair um, so I think the first, uh, you know, the first really comprehensive uh, assessment of this was, was in the G3 registry where um, Frederico Ash did a analysis and came up with a couple of factors that suggested a, a higher complexity scale and a, a risk for lower outcomes. But that was, it was really difficult to uh, apply that to the real world because it was, you know, multivariable analysis. It's only a couple of factors came out. So in the G4 registry, Rogers uh, or our, our group led by Rogers looked at um, looked at uh, different kinds of complexity, sort of suitable M tier patients who who were at risk for stenosis because they had a relatively small metro blood annulus or pre-existing gradient, and pa and patients who had very complex anatomy, either primary or secondary, um, that one would predict might give a lower likelihood of achieving one plus MR. So that was that would be the risk for stenosis and risk for inadequate reduction. So in the in the in the patients who are felt to be sort of good standard risk, um, in in the in the you know breaking down their anatomic complexity, looking at their cases in a core lab with again I think this is Frederico Ash's data, um, the um, what we, you know we see what we would expect from the from the overall cohort. The 90% plus of patients are going to have one plus or less MR, and uh, and consequently all the stuff that goes with that. In patients who are at, um, at uh, risk for stenosis, it turns out that technology works reasonably well. Um, you can expect even better outcomes in terms of MR reduction because these patients don't have a bunch of area to work with, so you can really pull tissue together. Um, but uh, the gradients were, were uh, you know, pretty acceptable at 4.5, and if you think about it, a mitral valve replacement typically have a gradient in that range. That being said, there's risk for stenosis and then there's risk for stenosis. Um, there are some patients that are simply, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a cohort that was felt to be at risk for stenosis, but still doable. There are certainly patients who are just too at risk for stenosis and shouldn't be done. And, uh, and, and this is not to suggest that patients with mitral stenosis should be treated with, with edge to edge repair. That, that's ridiculous. Um, but there are, are cases where it's borderline where you can end up with a with a reasonable outcome. And I think the more, most important take from this paper was the risk of inadequate reduction. So patients with more complex disease, they didn't have 90% one plus MR, they had 75% one plus MR. They still got pretty good results with, um, with up to 90, uh, you know, more than 90% of patients achieving MR reduction down to two plus or better, which is associated, as we'll see later in this talk, with, with improved outcomes compared to severe MR, but, but I think this is more realistic and 
and tells us a little bit about, about what we would see in real world. Now, I will say that this analysis was only 50 patients, the, the, the risk for inadequate stenosis, uh, or at risk for inadequate reduction. This is only, they only found 50 patients that met this criteria in the overall thousand patient cohort. And that doesn't really reflect what we see in the real world. So we did our own analysis and I've submitted this uh, and, and I'm trying to get it accepted. And I'm hoping that it gets accepted to, to a, a journal that I, I want it to be in soon, but well, we're working through that. Um, so we came up with this case complexity tool. It was actually a tool that was developed by uh, about five of us. I was one of those people uh, to try uh, in conjunction with Abbott Vascular to sort of give their field tech team uh, or the field support team some kind of indication of how long cases were going to take to better you know, uh, budget their time. But when I saw this, uh, they, they decided not to use it for that. But when I saw this, I said, gee, this, this is a very comprehensive way of assessing complexity in, in mitral anatomy, and maybe we could use it to better characterize, um, you know, what what the world is really like, and, and use it as a tool for predicting how patients will do. And um, and uh, so in, we looked at um, all of our G3 and G4 cases. Um, this is about a, two years ago, um, and I presented it at ACC. And again, like I'm trying to get it published, but that's not always the easiest thing. Anyway. So in this study, about half of our patients fell into a less complex uh, category, and about half of our patients fell into a more complex category. And um, the patients who fell into the less complex category had exactly what we expected to find in the, in the overall G4 cohort, a 92% MR reduction down to, to less than 1%, uh, 1 plus. But about half of our patients fell into a more complex scale. Um, and again, just like in the risk for inadequate reduction, about a 75% uh, one plus MR. And I think what's different than this in the Rogers patient paper is that, you know, this actually, I think, reflects uh, the real world and, and is what sort of what we were saying, us in the group that, are, that sort of think about this and talk about it a lot, that, you know, this is sort of reflective of what we see, I think, in the real world. So where is M tier for primary MR, meaning flail or pro prolapse? So surgery is still the standard of care for uh, symptomatic or even asymptomatic patients. Um, a minimally invasive mitral valve repair is an exquisite surgery and will likely remain the standard of care for a very long time, if not forever, um, and is a class one uh, indication. M tier though, because of the growing body of evidence and the improved outcomes is now a 2A for high and uh, prohibitive risk patients. So, um, so if you're a standard operative risk, you should get an operation. If you are symptomatic and fall into a higher prohibitive risk category and your anatomy is conducive to M-tier, then M-tier is considered a 2A guideline recommendation and, and reasonable and appropriate. But there's a whole bunch of overlap between excellent surgical candidate and lousy surgical candidate. And this is uh, where, where heart teams meet and, and try to come up with, with um, with an answer for that individual patient based on the best data that we have. And, and so there's a big overlap uh, in this sort of moderate risk category where right now, if you're a moderate risk, a surgeon will take this on as the, as the, as the class one indication. Um, but, but you could make an argument that patients who are at moderate risk, um, uh, you know, safety may actually be critically important. And in, and in times when MR reduction is down to one, one plus in 90% of patients and well-selected patients, maybe there is a role for M tier as alternative to surgery in intermediate risk patients. And, uh, and that's the, uh, the repair MR trial. There's another trial called primary, but repair MR trial is the, is the trial that's got the most momentum and probably will finish first. And this is looking at patients who fall into an intermediate category and that's controversial, but it's basically patients over 75 who have, or who have an STS score of greater than 2%. And, and in MR reduction uh, or MR surgery, you have to be you have to be pretty intermediately sick to get a a two percent mortality because surgery is you know minimally invasive surgery is pretty safe. So I think this will be instructive. Um, it's it's really enrolling pretty you know steadily. It's not like gangbusters, but it's getting there. And this will this trial will complete. Um, unfortunately, we won't have answers for years because it's a you know it's a ten year follow up. Uh, but we'll get some data at least probably in the you know at at um, at one year and five years from now in five years. So let's move on now to uh, secondary MR. So we've talked about primary MR. Secondary MR is the more common form of mitral insufficiency, typically associated with reduced ejection fraction uh, and heart failure. So 
when MTIR has been applied to, uh, to secondary MR, we have the, uh, the, the COAP trial, uh, which was the largest and, and most definitive of those trials. And we're going to also talk about Mitral France, but COAP um, was a wonderful a trial that I, I was lucky to have the opportunity to be a part of where patients were uh, randomized who had secondary MR were optimized on medical therapy. And if they still had severe MR after optimization on, on guideline directed medical therapy for heart failure, they were randomized to CLIP or no CLIP and followed now out to five years. And again, uh, procedural outcomes are what we would expect from, uh, from, uh, from MTIR. Um, and this is again, a mitral CLIP study, uh, but um, fairly low uh, um, complications associated with procedure and MR reduction rates of 80% one plus MR. And now understand this was with first generation CLIP. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I think you could imagine that, um, that, that the outcomes might even be better now if it was reconducted with, with G4 technology. But that said, with the technology available, um, they were able to, we were able to obtain a, a substantial improvement in outcomes. So the primary outcome was driven by heart failure hospitalization, uh, and it was reduced uh, dramatically out to um, the, two, the two year point with a number needed to treat of three to prevent a heart failure hospitalization. It also improved survival uh, with a number needed to treat of eight out to, out to two years. And now we have, um, or, and additionally, uh, in addition to improving quality of life, reducing heart failure hospitalization and improving survival, it reduced um, the need for uh, LVAD and transplant. So, so pretty impressive stuff. And the number needed to treat there is better than you would see with the application of Corrigan heart failure. That is not to say it's first line before heart, heart failure medicines, but in terms of impact, it is just as impactful as, as some of the medical therapies that we think are crazy if, we, if you don't apply them. So we now have data in COEP out to five years, and uh, we see that those curves continue to split and they, um, they're, they're durable. You know, This isn't just a short-term benefit. This is a benefit that continues accruing benefits for years in advance as long as the patient survives. And what's interesting is that for the patients in the, um, in the control arm that did not receive CLIP, there was a crossover period at two years. And the patients that crossed over, their curves suddenly started to mirror the, the active treatment arm. So it's never too late to do this therapy. And it, it sort of gives further evidence that, that the device is really doing what the uh, data suggests that it was doing. In the background, though, there was another trial that published simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine called Mitral France. And Mitral France was supposedly the same trial. It was a secondary MR trial in patients receiving medical therapy, a randomized to CLIP or no CLIP, and it showed no difference, no difference in survival, no difference in heart failure hospitalizations. So, um, so how do we contrast those two trials? Well, I think the difference is that, that MitraClip was approved for secondary MR in Europe where this was conducted, Mitra France, whereas it was not yet approved or paid for by Medicare in the secondary MR population in the United States during COAP. So really the only way that you, you could do a MitraClip Mitra in a secondary MR patient was to participate in the clinical trial. So, so they, they're likely different populations. And in fact, if you look at the data, they were different populations. The Mitra France patients tended to be more two plus MR, uh, you know, non-severe MR, um, and the ventricles tended to be more um, dilated and blown out, sort of more end-stage patients. And you can imagine that that would be true if, like, the only way you can use CLIP in secondary MR in the United States is through a clinical trial. Then everybody's going to go in. If the only way that you know, you know, if you can pretty much do the patients that you think are going to do well commercially. And you then you're only going to randomize the patients for which you think there's equipoise. So a, a sicker, more end stage population got into Mitra France, and that that may simply bias the, the study towards the null because those patients were all at death's door to begin with. And um, and Paul Grayburn, Grayburn uh, in Texas did an analysis of the uh, echo data, and and it and it suggests exactly that, and it came up with a concept of the Grayburn curve or proportionality versus disproportionality of MR. So if, if you have a lot of MR uh, and your ventricle's not totally blown, um, then, then you're likely to get COAP-like results. If you have borderline MR and you have a, you know, six and a half, seven centimeter ventricle, then you're not, then you're not going to do as well because those patients are all end stage and, uh, and you miss the boat and the cat's out of the bag and lots of other hyperboles. So, um, so I, I think that when we're picking patients, we have to see 
we have to involve our heart failure colleagues and get a sense of how big is the ventricle, how end stage is the ventricle, is this patient better for um, VAD and transplant and, or, or hospice, or is the patient still salvageable? Do they have an EF? You can stop an EF at 25% and three plus MR and get substantial benefit, but probably not 10% and two to three plus MR. So, um, so which patients are going to do better? I think the patients to avoid are the patients with you know truly disproportionate MR that I talked about, uh, patients with severely impaired right ventricular function. I think uh, you know actually if you apply dead right ventricle to any situation in medicine, it's a dead patient. They don't do well. We don't have good treatments for, for poor RV function other than transplant. Uh, patients with rip roar and severe, severe pulmonary hypertension um, that's not secondary to poorly treated heart failure are, are not going to symptomatically do well and do well from a, a survival standpoint. And then patients who have torrential TR uh, out of proportion to their borderline MR, you know, their symptoms are driven by their TR and they're not going to do as well. And, and when you apply these sort of criteria, patients tend to uh, tend to do fairly well with CLIP if you avoid these patients. So just to summarize it up, uh, M tier for secondary MR uh, improves quality of life, improves survival, reduces um, uh, uh, substantially reduces the relative risk of mortality, uh, and re um, reduces the risk of heart failure hospitalization by half with a number needed to treat of three, which is just impressive. So um, how has it been applied in the real world? So we, we then did um, a, a sort of a, uh, an analysis of how it had been applied uh, in the real world of over 5,000 patients compared to a smaller number of, of, of patients in the COAP trial and COAP-like patients. Um, and what, and that, that larger group of patients are where things might be a little more borderline. The patients might be a little bit more like, like uh, mitral France patients. And I think what we saw was that there's a continuum that it's not like, oh, you're a co-op patient or you could do amazing, or oh, you're a mitral France patient and, uh, and there's no purpose in doing anything for you. There's a continuum where that number needed to treat gets lower, the more you look like a co-op patient and much higher approaching infinity, the more you look like uh, a uh, mitral France patient. But then in general, that there are patients who are in between that are going to seem to do better. And again, this is not randomized, but if you compare it to the control arm of, of COAPT, uh, the patients tend to do better with the application of CLIP. So I think the way I would interpret this is um, for patients where, where they're clearly more abund, you know, obviously just they need something else or, or they need hospice. But there are patients where you're like, I don't know, it might help, it might not help. Um, and if you, if you make these decisions in conjunction with your heart failure team uh, and your heart failure team is not uh, nihilistic about uh, tier, uh, then, then it, probably the nod goes to CLIP because it's such a safe technology and there's so much compelling evidence for benefit, even in patients who sort of are in the overlap range. So uh, and actually, when they did an analysis of the Mitra France trial, there were patients with, embedded within Mitra France who looked more like COAP patients. And no surprise, those patients did, uh, did better with, with CLIP than without CLIP. So I, I think this, this um, reflects the concept that we want to uh, bucket these things into into uh, binary categories, uh, uh, co-op-like patients and mitral France patients. But in reality, the real world is there's a continuum and you'll get a continuum of, of improvement in, uh, uh, in outcomes by application of the, of the therapy. So um, uh, beyond edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair, I think it is important to think of these patients as a, as, a, as a therapeutic continuum, not just a target population to do a procedure. So if a patient with secondary MR and heart failure hospitalization uh, presents to you, um, you are, your, your primary role is to improve the patient's outcome. And we know that, that we improve the patient's outcome primarily by application of guideline-directed medical therapy. That's why it's a class one indication. Um, and what we also know is that the faster you apply that, the better they do. So one of the things that was frustrating in the COAP trial is that um, we would put these patients into, um, in, you know, we would identify them and talk to them about the trial and then we would send them to the heart failure team. And a lot of times they would just fester there for six months or more and then come back to us after their meds were titrated. And we actually have some evidence now that suggests that's actually harmful and not the right care. And, and this comes from the heart failure community. It's not a criticism of the heart failure community, but that, um, that the faster you apply within reason, guideline directed medical therapy, the better they do. So in, in general, um, uh, you know, you should give your, your team at most two to three months to get to target. Now, how do you do that? Well, in the old days, 
um, you know, or and, and in many practices still, when a patient is seen for titration medicines, you're seen, you get some Coreg, I'll see you back in one, one month or two months, they go up on their Coreg, I'll see you back in a month, you add some uh, ARNI, you see the back, like that six months later, you're maybe at, at guideline direct medical therapy. In reality, these patients need to be seen every week. And it's hard for a clinical practitioner, a, you know, a physician to do that. So we, we and many other practices have stood up what we call our heart failure transition clinic or specialty heart failure APP driven clinics where those patients can be seen frequently and their meds can be titrated up as quickly as possible to get to guideline directed medical therapy rather than messing around because we know from COAP that if you just sit on them, they die and they get rehospitalized. So, uh, and we know that the later that these patients present, even though we can help them with M tier, the, the worse their outcomes and the less likely they are to benefit. So, so once a patient is identified, they need to come to a structural uh, group uh, or they need to start in the heart failure group, but somebody needs to take them seriously and up titrate their medicines quickly and, and get them through. So the practical approach to applying guideline directed medical therapy and timing a tier, all patients should get their meds titrated up in less than three months. And, and, uh, and optimal medical therapy means the best they can tolerate, usually a heart rate less than 70 and a blood pressure less than 120. Some people would say, you know, you want to get your blood pressure down to 90, but many, a lot of patients can't tolerate. It's basically get them to where they can tolerate and don't mess around uh, on minutia. Just get them through the system because we know they do better when, when this stuff is rapidly applied, not just M tier, but medical therapy as well. Um, remember, uh, resynchronization therapy or CRT is also a class one indication for patients with a wide left bundle and a, and a depressed ejection fraction in, 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 um, in MR and improves outcomes dramatically. Um, and it can also, in about a third of patients and where it's applied who have severe MR, can reduce MR. Um, and, uh, and CRT should be applied prior to tier um, and then reassessed. So you get them through the system, two to three months, you repeat an echo if they still have severe MR, if they have, um, if they have a wide left bundle, you apply CRT, but only if they can wait. If they keep getting hospitalized, then uh, then you can make an argument that you do these things simultaneously. Um, so um, refer them early, get that repeat echo within two to three months. And then once they've had this, uh, this technology applied, when m tier is applied, oftentimes their blood pressure will go up. And the co-op trial showed us that you can continue up titrating medicines that you wouldn't have been able to up titrate before, which can add benefit to their long-term outcome. So where are we with uh, FMR in the guidelines? So guideline-directed medical therapy and CRT are class one indications. M2, uh, M tier is a class two indication. So now M tier is a class two indication, uh, class 2A indication for both primary and secondary MR. And interestingly, where in primary MR, surgery is a class one indication, surgery in secondary MR is a class 2B indication. Um, and it doesn't mean that surgery can't be appropriately applied in secondary MR, but M tier is probably the right answer for most patients in if their anatomy is conducive to M tier, because it doesn't really burn any bridges. Surgical, you know, the surgery um, in randomized trial looking at surgical repair versus replacement in secondary MR showed not the same dramatic benefit in repair. And you could make an argument, again, debatable, that uh, the appropriate th surgical therapy for secondary MR, if you're going to apply it, is replacement, although, uh, you know, there's lots of room for debate there. So um, a, a word on the other category of uh, functional MR, which is atrial functional MR. So I, I actually didn't even like, when I started in this field, I didn't know anything about mitral insufficiency, but again, that was 20 years ago. And, um, and I think uh, our, our understanding of all of this as cardiologists has, has improved over time and, and maybe now mirrors a little bit what the surgeons were seeing and sort of already understood. Um, and that is that, um, that there is a category uh, that probably comprises a good 10% of the MR out there or more, where, where it's not a, a leaflet problem, it's not prolapse or flail, it's not a ventricle problem, the ventricle is pumping okay, it's not a tethered posterior leaflet, but rather the atrium is, is overly large or sometimes the ventricle is dilated, and the leaflets are sort of pulled apart and flattened, and that's uh, and, and they have a central jet rather than a bias jet to one, one direction or the other. And the problem is, is there's just no area for coaptation because everything's pulled apart and tented flat. And that's called atrial functional MR. It's very different and has different treatment and different outcomes. And it's also much more poorly uh, studied. So specifically, atrial functional MR is, um, is uh, uh, something that potentially could improve. So first, the, the first line therapy is diuretics. It's not heart failure medicines because they don't have, F, they have, they have uh, HEFPEF, not HEFREF frequently. 
So, um, but diuretics will sometimes shrink everything a little bit and make the MR better. But um, additionally, keeping them in regular rhythm has been shown to improve uh, MR grades. So you could make an argument that, and again, less level one evidence, but that, um, that afib ablation or trying to actively keep them in regular rhythm is a, is a potential first line therapy for these atrial functional MR patients. But a lot of them, their ventricle, their atria are just too large and too blown for that. So, um, so it turns out that um, M-tier can be applied in these patients. And it really just depends on how pulled apart the leaflets are. If the leaflets are barely in coaptation, you're not going to be able to pull them together and achieve that coaptation. But there are some patients where, where it's not so dramatic that the leaflets are barely even touching. And, um, and you can apply this technology safely with, with, um, with some registries suggesting you know, acceptable outcomes, though not quite as good as you would expect from more ideal anatomy. And unfortunately, that's sort of what we see in the tricuspid space as well. So let's turn to outcomes. So, um, uh, so it, uh, should we be satisfied with 2 plus MR? Uh, we know in the early days, we used to say um, that uh, clinical success was, a, was an improvement in severe down to moderate because there are tons of patients walking around with moderate MR. Surgeons would never accept that, but maybe, maybe, um, maybe our, the way of looking at it is wrong. Well, it turns out there is clinical benefit to, to getting patients from severe MR down to moderate MR, but there is even more benefit in getting down to less than or equal to 1 plus MR. And, um, and I think that's important to think about when you're, when you're thinking about uh, where to refer patients if you don't actually perform this procedure, that the procedure is pretty straightforward enough that most people can get down to two plus MR, but centers that are sort of high volume are more likely to get to one plus MR. And maybe that's through a combination of picking good cases and also techniques, and, and the, maybe they're more likely to add additional clips and, and really work to get that result. Um, and I think that mirrors a little bit surgery, right? Uh, every surgery has the right and and uh, and credentialing to do mitral valve surgery, but as we all know, that, uh, that really high volume surgeons are the ones who have the best outcomes. So I think pick your center carefully, um, and if you're going to engage in this, uh, don't dabble in it. Um, you know, really really learn this te technique and get optimal outcomes and work hard to get it. So um, let's move on to other technologies. So the other technology that is approved. Uh, for M tier in this space is the Pascal device, which was just recently approved within the last couple of years. And, um, and it's a basically very similar to Mitra Clip um, and uh, just made by a different company. And uh, it has a, it, it, its main differences are that it's a bigger device. It's broader, longer arms. It's like an XTW on steroids. Um, it has a central spacer that may have some advantages to, to MR reduction. And, uh, and the way it gets out of the ventricle is instead of inverting, it lengthens. So there may be some uh, lower risk of chordal entanglement and uh, device interaction with the, with the mitral apparatus. It, um, it, its outcome in a randomized trial versus CLIP was presented. And again, not all of this was with, uh, with the G4 technology, but you know, fairly similar outcomes. And I think most people in the field uh, believe this is a welcome addition to the uh, M-tier uh, space and that, it's, um, that, that it may or may not have advantages over MitraClip and that that is still sort of being sorted out, but it's, it, but it's at least as good as MitraClip and, um, and each device is, is probably similar. So let's move on from what's approved now to um, what the future may look like and what new technologies are that are being investigated and, um, and may find their way into clinical practice. And one area that I think is interesting that I've been involved with is trans, transcortal uh, uh, transcatheter, transportal uh, neocord placement. Sort of, uh, you know, surgeons don't do edge to edge repair except in bailout situations, but they do apply uh, neocords. And, um, and so, why, why, why would we want to put in neocords as opposed to M tier? Um, you know, uh, surgery is, this is what surgeons do, it's a more physiologic repair. And mitral, minimally invasive mitral surgery is minimally invasive, but it's not minimally invasive like transcatheter therapies. So there's a whole uh, plethora of different companies working in this space. And I, I think it's you know, like I've done a full talk on this um, space. So suffice it to say, here's how the concept works. It's mostly uh, there are transapical devices, but most, most people understand that this field has to go. Uh, all, all technologies have to go transeptal to work. So generally from a transeptal access, an anchor is placed in the ventricle and then, a, then the leaflet that is prolapsing or flail, this is for primary MR only, is um, pierced and a pledge is, is drawn. And then in real time, you can uh, tension this all up and then bring the leaflet back into coaptation. The main advantages are it's a more physiologic re repair. There are no concerns about uh, causing a gradient. 
and you burn no bridges for future surgery like you do with clip because it doesn't scar the leaflet over. And uh, so you could even clip this in the future or you could do mitral valve repair and not wreck the leaflets the way that M tier, uh, that, that M -tier may. Um, I was involved in a, a technology uh, called Cardiomech. And I think my own experience with that illustrates a little bit of the entire field. And that is we were able to get a successful repair in our first in man case, uh, but, the, uh, but the ventricular anchor pulled out. Other technologies they've had pull throughs through the, through the mitral, I'm sorry, our, our ventricular anchor did well. Our, we had a pull through through the mitral leaflet in other technologies, the ventricular anchor has pulled out. The bottom line is, is this is iterative. This is the way new technology works. It will get better. And I actually think there may be a place for this technology in primary MR, particularly in younger, healthier patients where, um, where you know, um, where you're gonna not wanna burn bridges with MitraClip, but it, for, for something like this, it could be an upfront therapy uh, that that is, that's the surgical community might might be less uh, sort of offended by. So um, let's move on to new technologies for secondary MR. So um, when surgeons treat secondary MR, if they don't replace the valve, they usually um, treat with, uh, with an annular ring uh, or band to try to bring the entire annulus smaller and bring the leaflets into coaptation. So there's a couple of ways we can potentially do this uh, percutaneously. One is sort of indirectly and one is directly. So indirectly um, generally means you're not applying something directly to the annulus. And, and there are a variety of different concepts here. Uh, devices that pierce the heart and wrap the heart around the outside, devices that that bridge the uh, the mitral annulus and pull in the AP diameter, and then devices that are applied into the uh, coronary sinus that, that sort of approximates the the annulus and pulls everything together. These are all sort of incomplete devices, and um, given the the difficulty with with you know the less than perfect outcomes with surgical uh, ringing as opposed to a surgical repair. Um, you would imagine that incomplete um, technologies will be even less effective. Um, and I, I think a lot of these technologies haven't really gone anywhere, but the one that's sort of gone the farthest and I believe now has completed its randomized trial and should be presenting soon is the Carillion device, which is the um, device that's placed in the coronary sinus. And then over time, uh, the nitinol cinches the sinus down, um, again, incompletely. The main advantage is it's easy to perform. It's done from a tran transjugular approach. You put the device in and, and you're done. The disadvantage is, is that it really only has modest MR reduction and there's some risk of compression of the circumflex. And we'll see. Um, we'll see if this has any role through its randomized trial. Um, direct annuloplasty devices, uh, including cardioband, millipede, amend, um, they've, they've really struggled. I, I think um, millipede's uh, program was shut down. Cardioband it was bought by uh, Edwards and has sort of festered out there. I, I'm not sure this is going to go anywhere. Uh, the main uh, disadvantage is uh, that it's just too complex and too time consuming, which is why they they sort of killed Millipede. And again, ring rings, um, you know, surgical rings aren't perfect either, even if you get a good result. So I, I think this this space is challenged, and we'll see if it really if anything goes there. Um, let's move on from repair techniques to replacement. So uh, transcatheter mitral valve replacement has been a has been the new uh, best thing for for more than a decade now, and is still not found a commercial product in the United States. The Abbott Tendine device is approved in Europe, so we're going to talk about some of these as a paradigm for the for the space and where replacement's going. Uh, as as all all replacement technologies, uh, CT planning is is the key, and um, things that you want to know are how big are the annulus and will your device fit. But also, what is this calculated neo LV outflow tract? Because most of the device sits in the ventricle, and um, in the anterior leaflet and mitral valve will we'll wrap over the device, in, even if you had a, a porous device. But most of these devices are covered with fabric, and so you you're, you have the potential to block the LV outflow tract, which is probably the most important uh, contraindication to this technology. So the Tendine device has the most uh, the most data, uh, and it is um, a, a transapically placed device. Uh, and one of the, the challenges with TMVR is not just um, the real estate it occupies in the left ventricle, but it's fixation at the mitral valve annulus. This is, there's no, unlike TAVR, there's no calcium to hold it in place. So you have to find some mechanism to hold it. And the forces that push this device towards the atrium are profound because of the pressure difference between the ventricle and the atrium. So the, the way that Tendine does it is it, it has a tether to the apex. It's actually how you close the apical access hole. And, uh, and it's held in place by that tether as well as some outward force at the annulus. 
And um, and so we have some data now that suggests that the, the that the technology is really good at reducing MR. If you get a if you get a TMBR in general, unless you have significant paravalvular leak, you're going to have no MR at the end. Uh, the device, when applied appropriately, is relatively safe. But we all know that transapical procedures are are you know like a lot more than a transeptal uh, delivered technology. So uh, and I think this sort of gets at the point that TMBR is not TAVR in another position. The mitral valve is way more complex. There's no calcium to hold it in place. And the pressure differentials really want to push that device into the atrium. Transapical access is just cardiac surgery light. Uh, the goal is a transeptal delivery, but it's pretty challenging to do it transeptal. Valve thrombosis is an issue. These devices are, are subject to thrombosis and require anticoagulation, probably warfarin, not DOAX. Um, there's, uh, the main exclusion is LV outflow tract obstruction. There is some risk of paravalvular leak and the device can embolize. Um, getting to transeptal, there are a couple of paradigm devices. The Edwards M3 device just finished its um, clinical trial. It is a uh, interesting concept of a docking station. So transeptally, you deliver this circle and you wrap the cords. That's the hardest part of the procedure, which makes this procedure really challenging. Once you have that, that sort of docking station in place, then you place a modified Sapien 3 called M3, that's basically covered with fabric inside that docking station. Um, the, the main challenges of this technology are that um, it's hard to wrap the cords and when it works, it works, but, but when it doesn't, there's a lot of PVL. Um, so we'll see what this, what this clinical trial shows, um, uh, but, but um, this may end up becoming a commercial product. Uh, I like showing this technology. I don't know how far it's gonna go, but we were involved in the early feasibility. Um, so one of the, the main contraindications to, um, to M tier, I'm sorry, to uh, TMVR uh, is that is the LV outflow tract construction, and, and that's partly uh, necessitated by fixation. So this is a device that tries to occupy as little real estate in the ventricle as possible by, um, by, by basically becoming a watchman for the left atrium. So it is, uh, so they take the CT data set for the patient and they create a device that is oversized in all dimensions for the atrium. And then you can place the device. And this was um, one of the, I think the, within the first four patients treated. And they did really well with this device for a couple of years and died of, of um, non-MR related issues. Uh, but it can now be placed trans, uh, transeptally uh, and is fixated in place just by pressure from the, from the atrium. So kind of a cool concept. It's crazy enough that it just might work. Um, I don't know where it's going to go. It's not been um, purchased by any specific companies, but it is, is um, approaching end of its clinical trial, and hopefully we'll see some data soon. Um, I, I, one of the devices that I'm more excited about is the, um, is the other Abbott device uh, called Sophia, um, and it's sort of like um, it's transeptally delivered, and it is, it's sort of like an Amplatzer device for the, um, for the mitral valve. There's two discs, one that's uh, applied um, from the uh, ventricular side and the one at the atrial side that grasps the, the, um, the annulus, and then you have your device. And I, I think one of the cool things about it, it is, um, it is delivered through a modified mitral clip steerable guiding catheter, uh, and that allows the device to be deployed very coaxially, which is, you know, one of the challenges in any device deployment is you really need your device to be coaxial. So we were involved in some early feasibility of this uh, uh, rejiggered device and um, they're about, they're just restarting this clinical trial with a larger matrix of three devices. And so, you know, we're excited about this technology as well. But honestly, I would say uh, the future of TMBR has been the future for quite some time, and we still haven't uh, obtained a real viable commercial product, at least transeptally. Uh, the, the future of TMBR may actually be TTBR. So the Evoke device, which is really Cardia Q, which was rejiggered as EOS in the mitral space, uh, is called Evoke in the tricuspid space. And love me some Evoke, as, uh, as my friend Paul Mahoney says. Uh, this works really well uh, in the tricuspid space. This is a case that we did with, you can see uh, beautiful ice pictures. Um, they finished their clinical trial. It's two year follow-up and hopefully next year or shortly thereafter, we should have uh, some data on this. Uh, but but um, you know, the tricuspid space doesn't have quite as problems with fixation. It doesn't have LV outflow tract obstructions. Uh, this may, you know, we may have a commercially viable tricuspid replacement before we have a commercially viable mitral replacement. Um, so contrasting M tier with uh, TMBR, M tier is um, is probably safer. Um, the, the recovery is quicker. Um, the um, you don't need oral anticoagulation therapy. 
TMVR is going to be better MR reduction. Uh, both are, I think, fairly procedurally complex, somewhere in between. Um, there is a lot of data for M-tier. There's not much data yet for TMVR. Uh, M-tier uh, is, is established with uh, at least five-year durability. The first patient I ever treated made it 15 years before his MR um, started to fall apart, and that's not going to be true for every patient. But as but um, you know, we have some established durability with M-tier. We don't we don't have enough follow-up with TMVR. And then um, the the main drawbacks of M-tier are going to be leaflet-based, whereas for TMVR it's going to be um, LD outflow tract-based, and and the need uh, the ability to take or not take anticoagulation therapy. So um, so where 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 will the future be? I think there'll be a, re a role for both M-tier and TMVR. Um, hopefully, you know, we'll get an M, uh, a TMBR device that's approved in the United States soon, but it will very much depend on patient characteristics. But I would say, unless there are major advances in TMBR technology that allow it to be successfully and straightforwardly delivered transeptally, mitigate the LB outflow tract risk obstruction, and, um, and then sort of we understand better about oral anticoagulation therapy, MTIR is going to have a dominant role in, in uh, mitral therapies beyond surgery in this space. And, um, and, you know, and if the challenges are overcome, you know, uh, TMBR may, may really take a more dominant role, but I think that that's a long way off. And, um, and, and basically right now, TMBR is going to be relegated to unfavorable mitral anatomy and patients that, that can anatomically get a TMBR uh, or who have significant gradient or, or severe MAC. So, um, so um, what, what do we do? You know, let's say a TMBR product becomes commercially available, how will we pick? Because a, an M-tier system could potentially burn bridges for, for uh, a TMBR. Um, I think there is a place potentially for electrosurgery to buzz off. You know, you take a snare and electrify it and cut the leaflet and then tuck that, that, um, that clip to the side and then, you know, in the posterior annulus and then put a replacement technology. This has been done. I think this is aspirational, but but there may be a role for for contrasting devices so that you don't burn one, you don't make a binary decision, and you're stuck forever. Um, I'll briefly touch on other uh, mitral transcatheter therapies that that probably you need to think about because uh, because we see these patients too, and that is patients who've had a surgical replacement who failed. We we can put a, a Sapien three inside that space. It's now um, uh, you know, approved and, and been done countless times. It works fairly well. The main risks are, of course, LD outflow tract obstruction. There are ways to mitigate that with electrosurgery. Um, and, um, and we don't know what the long, long-term durability is, but for the, for the procedural safety and short-term outcomes, it's really you know, quite an elegant way to, to treat patients. Similarly, for failed rings, um, you can put a sapien in the failed ring. Of course, uh, you have to think about the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve wrapping over the frame and causing the same problems with LV outflow tract obstruction. Again, that could be potentially mitigated with electrosurgery that we're going to touch on. But um, the, the outcomes here are also approved, uh, or the technique is approved and, and Medicare pays for it, but, uh, but the outcomes are not quite as good as valve in valve replacement uh, because you're trying to fix the, the S3 into a two-dimensional structure instead of a three-dimensional structure, it can cant and there can be uh, more risk of, of um, perivabular leak, um, depending on how the, you know, what the original ring looked like. And then lastly, valve and mitral anterior calcification is the sort of most fraught area that has been undertaken. And so one of the problems for surgery is, is severe mitral anterior calcification. When a surgeon sees this on a CT, they're, they're not entirely pleased because it's very hard to sew into that calcium. And there are decalcification techniques that, uh, that can allow surgeons to, to, to treat this, but, but it's a problem and surgeons don't like it. I think that's a, a truism. So uh, S3 has been used in this situation uh, to um, you know, apply the valve that you, like you would a, a TAVR, but in the mitral space. Again, same, same precautions around um, uh, neo, uh, neo LV outflow tract, but there's a lot of risk of embolization and PVL. Um, because surgeons don't like sewing into it, it's been used in a hybrid way where you know, a rested patient in an open surgical where the, where the, the surgeon would be sewing uh, a valve, they'll actually take an S3 and sew uh, felt around the S3 and then apply it directly like you see here in an open field, just, just apply the, the, the valve there and then throw sutures where they can because the problem is a fixation of the device that's called Cetral. And then transcatheter from a transeptal approach, valve and MAC has been done. 
but again, um, results are even more fraught with more risk of embolization in PVL. But some centers have taken that on reasonably successfully. But I think um, just last month, within the last few weeks, uh, Meyer Guerrera uh, presented some of the five-year data now from the uh, valve and valve registry. And, and I think that valve and valve does pretty good out to five years, valve and MAC and valve and ring. Do, you know, may be better than doing nothing, but but those patients have challenging outcomes. And part of that is procedural because the, the technology isn't perfect. And I will say that Tendine will probably get approved in MAC. They have a MAC arm in Tendine, the, that TMDR technology. But in the interim, we just don't have anything for, for MAC. And, uh, and those patients, you know, the techniques aren't great, but also the patient population isn't great. And so if you're not a, sur- you know, if you're a surgical candidate, but you have MAC, that patient population may do better than the, the patient population has severe MAC and also not surgical candidates because those patients are just sick in lots of ways and they may just be more abundant. And I think we need to learn more about this before we apply it sort of broadly. And then what was I talking about electrosurgery? So the concepts of, of LV outflow tract obstruction are really problematic in this space. And so, um, you know, Adam Greenbaum, Vasilis Bavalaris, the team at Emory um, and, um, and, and, uh, um, the, and their collaborators at the NIH sort of came up with this concept has now been applied at many centers, including ours, and I'm probably yours as well, where you take a catheter and you split the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, or now something I haven't done, uh, which is kind of crazy, is to uh, actually uh, recreate in a catheter space the Moro pr- surgical procedure where you um, pay, basically place a, a catheter at the base of the a bulging septum and then surf a, a coronary CTO wire through, exit on the other side, snare it, electrify it, and split split it in half called set open sesame procedure. And that uh, has been shown to substantially improve neo alveolar outflow tract areas. So there's a lot of work being done here. The problem with this technique is it's really, really complicated. And, um, and it's really not for every center. And even for the centers that do it, unless you're Emory, uh, and do it all the time. It's it's not lickety split, and uh, and it's not perfect. So we need better techniques and technologies. I think there's a, a room for that stuff, but but um, what we need better um, technologies and techniques to apply it more broadly to to the, the community. So I, I think um, getting towards the end here, lifetime management of these patients. I think we we all think of lifetime management now with transcatheter therapies. And I think first, if a, a surgeon's going to offer, say, look, we're going to put in a valve or we're going to put in a, a ring, you need to be thinking of like what's next, um, because some of these patients are not going to outlive their, 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 their they are going to outlive their first surgery. So if you're going to do a replacement, you should pick the uh, valve frame that is the lowest profile and then point the valve in an angle away from the LV outflow tract as much as is physically possible. And then think about that septum and whether septal reductive therapies are, are, are going are, are to sort of be helpful for future planning. And that, that's not possible for every patient, but I think it's important to think about what's the next step surgically. And similarly, in surgical repair, um, you can't offer a patient a future valve and ring if they have an incomplete ring or uh, a rigid ring uh, that's shaped in a way that's gonna leave, leave PBL um, it, it, because the, because the uh, ring isn't dispensable. So how will this all play out in the future? This is my predictions. I don't think they're terribly bold. Um, mitral valve is complex and there will likely not be one tool for all situations. Surgery will remain the standard of care for primary MR for the foreseeable future. m will be remain an option for PMR and high surgical risk candidates and the repair MR trial will instruct the, uh, those intermediate risk patients. And then all the patients who are, are in between, that's for the heart teams to sort out. And hopefully you have a functional heart team that works well together and applies appropriate technology to individual situations as best you can. Um, and then MTER will continue to grow in the secondary MR space after guideline-directed medical therapy. And uh, TMBR technologies will, will grow in PMR and SMR, uh, uh, anatomically less favorable MTER categories. And electrosurgery hopefully will become easier and more widespread and will and will then because it's necessary to have that for these therapies to expand. We just did um, a, a picardia device in the aortic space to cut leaflets. I will tell you that it was so much easier than basilica. Um, I can see the future. Um, those catheter-based th- therapies are kind of Super Bowl and they make you feel like really fancy and special when you do them, but they're they're really hard and time consuming and and I think Things that, that are successful are safe and easy. And I think that devices uh, need to iterate to get us there. 
So with that, I've done uh, a lot of talking and maybe I'll, uh, we have uh, a few minutes for questions and I'll end the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Mike, wow. Uh, that was one of the most uh, complete and thorough presentations I've seen. I really appreciate that. I learned so much. Um, before I pass you on to the fellows, um, Mike, I had a question myself. Um, just looking, I mean, clearly tear has become the predominant therapy um, worldwide for mitral regurgitation, um, certainly in high-risk DMR and FMR, I think more and more so. Um, however, when you look at the actual numbers of cases being done annually, right, and certainly the US and even Europe, there's been some some like interesting things. So since when I was working in Europe four years ago, two thirds of cases were FMR and only one third DMR. And now it's almost 50-50. DMR is increased. And I suspect some of that has been the effect of mitre FR. Uh, but when you look at the US, and I don't have the exact numbers, but I keep hearing these, these thoughts that the mitral tier numbers are not increasing at the rate that everybody expected. Um, that we all expected that with, you know, um, certainly with COAP, it was going to explode. Uh, and we'd be all be doing so much more. And certainly my volume has increased, but I see, speak to lots of centers and they tell me they're seeing static volume. Any thoughts on why we haven't seen this, this tumultuous growth we were expecting? Yeah, I, I, um, it's all conjectural, but I think a lot of these problems are multifactorial. I think that, um, you know, those of us in the interventional community, especially that do structural heart, this is like exciting and like, duh, why wouldn't you apply this stuff? But I, I think that isn't necessarily translated out to the general cardiology and heart failure community. There are some heart failure doctors that are, that, that are you know, my, my system uh, to a large extent adopts this and thinks it's a good idea. But I have some naysayers, even in my own heart failure transplant team that, that aren't, aren't sending as many patients. And so we need to do a better job of getting that, getting that word out. I think that's one problem. Uh, and getting sort of adoption in the non-interventional community as this is like the best thing since sliced bread the way that we think it is. Yeah. Um, so it's, some of it is messaging. Some of it is uh, is that, you know, it's still a pretty complex procedure. You know, TAVR is factory work. You know, as long as you get the pre-procedural planning done, it should just follow the directions. It's really not that hard. And, uh, and you can bang out five cases in a day. Whereas mitral clip is, you know, it's technically challenging. Um, and you have to have a good partner. You know, it's not just about an operator. It's about a team. The, the imager um, has, to, has to be, you know, the imager is 60% of the procedure. And right now we don't have uh, a way to make those people whole. So there's, uh, you know, there's some, some throughput issues. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, that it's just, you know, multifactorial as to why it hasn't uh, sort of blown up. Um, and I, I think also, by the way, in secondary MR, medical therapy works. So I, I think the centers that have really killed it in secondary MR, um, they they sort of like give a wink and a nod to uh, to uh, medical therapy, and then they end up treating a lot of patients that have probably that somebody had really worked hard at getting their MR down. Like sometimes you give them medical therapy and their MR gets better. So I think it's like like five different reasons um, uh, conservatively. Um, yeah. But I think messaging will help with that space to grow. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Mike. Let's pass into the fellows. I'm just going to do in the order I see on my screen. Andrea? Hi, good morning. Thank you very much for this lecture. We really saw so many devices, so many techniques. And <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, we know, uh, as you say, that here is extremely safe. So um, which are the outcomes you would expect from the new devices and the new trials to be uh, to become a good alternative to tier in the future? Yeah, so I, I think that, um, that, uh, that neocord placement is pretty cool and it's very safe and it's really not that challenging, but, um, but it's a niche. And the question is, will, will that niche, you know, will it, I, I know it works in straightforward cases, but I also know that MitraClip works in straightforward cases. Will we, you know, the more devices we apply in a space of limited amount of people doing stuff to begin with is going to dilute all that. So the question is, will that niche really take up? I think there's a real potential role for it, but I just don't know how many people are going to adopt it and get good at it because you have to do something over and over again to get good at it. 
And in, in, you know, in TAVR, a busy program is like, you know, three to 500 cases. In, in Mitral, a busy program is like 100 cases. So, so you, you know, most centers are doing 25 cases to, to 40 cases a year. Like, like they're never going to get good at, at multiple different platforms. So I, I don't know where, where neocortal technology will go in the real world. I think replacement has real potential, but the key is that, um, that it's got the, you know, Sophia is a great device, but it's still 40 French. It's got to get smaller. Um, it has to get, um, you know, it has to apply to a decent number of cases because that LV outflow tract obstruction is an issue. And then, um, and then a lot of these patients, they can't take anticoagulation therapy. And so, so I, I think that, that probably the market will, will slowly, gradually tick up for replacement, but, it, but I don't think MTR is ever going to be like Tavern. I don't think it's going to be like, oh, clip's going to go away. Um, the, the one actually, I was, I actually had an argument with the, with the leader of Abbott about, um, the clinical equipoise for the tendine randomized arm where it was randomizing versus clip, because I, I said, you know, look, the, this is a transapical procedure. How can you randomize this versus clip and yeah. something like that? Um, you know, I had, it was early in my experience, I'd seen some pretty not great outcomes with it. Yeah. And, and the concept was, was like, look, we got to get this approved because there are a lot of centers that can't do this, or they're very surgeon driven and are not into MTIR and they want to be part of the procedure. And to open up the field to, to more patients, you have to have a device that, that every man can do. And, and while I wouldn't say that Tendine is easy, it's a little less imaging dependent and it's very, you know, you put the transable sheet, then you deploy the device, you close the apex. Um, so I, I think there is a, you know, again, simple, straightforward, not too complex and safe often win the day as long as it's reasonably effective. So I, I, I think that TMBR is going to grow, but not nearly as much as it should. And, I, and as um, uh, Azim said, I'm a little bit bummed out that, that uh, MTR isn't growing the way that, that Taver has because we have good data that supports it. It's just mitral is a way more complex space. It's not so binary the way that Taver is. Completely agree, Mike. I, you know, it was interesting. I'd love to see the data for the U.S. as in, you know, how many clips are performed per, cent per center. I, I looked at it for Tava from data from like a year or two ago, and I was surprised. I mean, I agree with you. A big program is over 300 cases. Only 5% of the over 800 centers in the United States do over 300 cases. Um, and probably 50% do under 100. That's for Tava which is a pretty standardized procedure. And there are a lot of patients out there. So I'd love to see the numbers for Tierra. I, I would not be surprised that more than 50% of, of centers do under 25 cases, yeah. which makes it very hard to build volume uh, yeah. and get, get better at it. I don't know about yourself, but I find, and I've probably done six, 700, maybe more tiers, and I'm still learning on every case. Hey, um, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that in that, you know, I've been doing tier for now almost 20 years and, um, and it's all about cadence, you know, like uh, you lose your edge if you're not doing at least four cases a month. You really do. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Guillem? Yeah, hi. Very well, thank you for this very large uh, overview of TMDR. Uh, just in the same uh, subject, um, we know that it's very hard to have any patient on the heart failure team, by example, in the secondary MR. In practice, you you say that it's almost three or, or, or three or six months of uh, medical treatment before to propose uh, a, a repair. Do you think there is a room for a subgroup of population for early procedure and maybe like a more aggressive way to propose after one month or three months? Because it's something maybe we have to work with the heart failure team. And what is your perspective and your overview on this uh, on this point? And really, thank you. Yeah, that's an, a fantastic question. So, um, is there are are there patients who should be more fast tracked? And I would say that the answer is absolutely yes. There are, you know, I think you you titrate the guideline directed medical therapy up as best you can as quickly as you can. But there are some patients who are you know, in borderline shock, um, where, where, where that's not been well studied in COAP, those patients are excluded, but we know, you know, we know anecdotally that those patients can do better. And it can be the, you know, it can be the different, like, look, we know that um, Primacor doesn't, uh, doesn't improve survival, may actually make survival worse, but it can get them out of the hospital and improve their quality of life. 
And so I've personally been involved in cases that would never have fit in co-apt where they were in low output state and, and you put a clip in and they're and I do a right heart cath before and after every clip I do. And I watch their cardiac index go up and they do better, they come off primacore. And that's not every case. And it involves a team-based strategy with, with, um, with your heart failure people. But, but I, can't, I don't think you can be prescriptive in every patient. That's why you know, the slow up titration, step-by-step -step approach you know, uh, is not necessarily the right answer. You have to look at the patient. These are your sickest patients. They're at high likelihood for mortality. They're at high likelihood for hospitalization. You know, as a practitioner, we shouldn't be spending our time filling up our clinics with worthless yearly follow-up of how's your lipids. It should be, you know, there's a room for that, but, it, but, but you really need to make room for these sick patients and see them quickly and frequently and get them through and then make some decisions. You know, you shouldn't, you know, it, you're not going to incrementally get a lot of more MR reduction by titrating from a hundred, uh, systolic blood pressure of 110 down to 100 and 102. So I, I think it, you can't be dogmatic and you have to sort of use clinical judgment. And that's hard because you can't protocolize that, but I think there is a role for early application of these technologies in super sick patients. And I personally, the, I remember uh, nice anecdotes. So the last patient I enrolled in COAPT, and, and I think it was the difference between me getting on that paper and not getting on the paper was from an outside institution and uh, we were ready to uh, randomize the patient and the outside surgeon said, I just want to put a VAD in the patient. And we're like, I actually had to my surgeon call their surgeon and say, no, no, the clip won't burn any bridges for you doing a VAD in the future. Please, please, please just let us randomize the patient. The patient was randomized. They randomized a clip and they never needed a VAD. And that, that I think is, uh, yeah. I think really indicative. And it got me in the New England Journal of Medicine paper. So <laughs> good of you. <laughs> Uh, last question, Julian, and then we have to let uh, Dr. Rinaldi get back to his cases and his patients. Of course. Uh, good morning, and thank you for this uh, great talk. I have uh, two questions uh, regarding the TMBR field, transpatheter uh, mitral valve replacement. Uh, as you know, TMBR systems have been uh, developed to treat a wider range of anatomies and valve failure mechanisms with a single technique. Um, However, a significant number of these patients uh, referred for TMBR are uh, rejected uh, due, to, uh, due to anatomic and sizing issues, which lead to uh, high rates of screening failure in, in some papers, even higher than 50%. So my third question is, uh, what are your thoughts on what is needed to decrease these rates of screening failure? And the other one is, uh, um, I'm just wondering if a replacement with dedicated devices, maybe in the future, maybe in five, 10 years, uh, will be performed only in just a few centers or maybe will be more uh, generalized, generalized. Thank you. Yeah, so excellent question. So I think there are two things that need to happen to really um, increase the applicability of TMVR. One is the devices need to have a smaller profile in the left ventricle. So it's, it, it'll never be perfect, but the, the smaller the LV out, the neo LV outflow tract, the better. Um, and remember, that's not going to get fixed with Lampoon because these devices, you know, it's not about the, the, the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve wrapping over the frame. The, these frames are all covered with fabric. So they, they create their own neo LV outflow tract issues. So you have to have, um, you know, as, as little uh, of a of a, a profile in the ventricle as possible. And that's why Alta valve is even still a thing because that's one of its main advantages. But I think, you know, devices like Sophia are, are pretty good, um, you know, way better than say Intrepid. And, um, and so I think that's one thing. So small as possible footprint in the ventricle. But I think also um, we need better um, uh, devices for septal reduction. And this, I, I'm very intrigued with this whole Sesame procedure. It is an order of magnitude more complex than lampoon, but if like technology finds a way, and uh, and and some of the results I've seen from uh, Adam and, and Vasilis's lab uh, really look impressive. This this concept of splitting the septum uh, it really does improve the neoalveolar alveolar tract. So if we can find devices that um, can do that without you know without Herculean effort, uh, uh, you know reliably. That may be a, a major advance that allows us to, to improve this, this app, application of technology. And then, um, you know, where do I think it's going to be five years from now? I don't think it's going to move that much. I think that um, we may get a, we'll have an approved Tendine 
we may have an approved M3. Um, and, and I think it'll creep up because right now it's only in clinical trials in the United States, but um, it'll creep up, but it's not going to blow the market away. I think it'll be a slow incremental schlog. Um, and I think it'll be applied primarily to patients that don't have good uh, M tier access, but, but it, it'll grow. It's just not going to grow as much as industry wants it to grow. That's my best prediction. Mike, uh, once again, uh, a phenomenal talk, great discussion uh, from the fellows. Thank you for your great questions. And I think we all learned so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'll see you in a couple of weeks in San Francisco at TCT. Absolutely. Thank okay. you so much. All right. Have Thanks a great so day. much. Thank you for okay. the Have a great day. Thanks, Mike.